Ooh. Welcome everybody to Marketing Matters. This is our weekly webinar where we, we bring you the experts in the industry when it comes to marketing your real estate business. So we've done industry expert, we've done our business development managers. Now we are focusing on our top producing agents because we've told you all about all these marketing tactics but who are the folks that are actually implementing these in their business and being successful? It is our top producers. So I've got a very special one on today. He's going to be talking to us about a topic that I think we can all benefit from, but because he is so special, he has brought his own hype man on today. Brooks, are you ready? Are you ready to bring it? Yes, ma'am, I am. Woo! Then roll, okay. <laughs> All right, guys, clarification. I am a hunter, I am not a gatherer. I spent the last two or three years with post-it notes all over my office. It was insane. The reason being, once I hunted something, I would have to skin it, I would have to dress it, and then I'd have to put it on the table. I do not do that anymore. I focus on the 20% that actually works for me. And the reason how I could do that is actually the man, the myth, the legend, the PhD professor, Mike Searcy. This guy allows you to be the hunter you are and reign the cash that you deserve. Very nice, Bruce. So what are we actually talking about today? We're talking about contracts and winning. And Mike's ratio for getting contracts accepted in this market, it is, I don't know what it is, Mike, but when I see these come across Landmark Titles desks, it looks like your ratio is 100%. So I don't know if there's a different ratio, but I'm going with 100%. You get all of your contracts accepted, which is hard in this market. So the man, the myth, the legend, tell us. How do well, you do it? <laughs> well, thank you very much. And, and you're right. Landmark does see 100% of the contracts we send to Landmark. 100. My uh -huh. ratio yep. is perfect. <laughs> That's right. Hey, everybody. My name is Mike Searcy. Um, I spent uh, a good chunk of my life both as a college professor. Um, a little bit of background on me. I have a PhD in communication studies, negotiation, persuasion, persuasion, broadcast, and media. Um, but having said some of that, um, let me go ahead and just put it out there that um, uh, I was just informed now that I have to keep this at about 20 minutes. And I had planned on the first hearing that I heard from Sarah who told me I had two hours and 20 minutes. So um, <laughs> let, let's just, you know, so if I speak a little fast as she kind of put in taking a breath as, as it were uh, going through. Um, but let's talk a little bit about winning contracts. Do we have a good track record for winning, winning them? Yes. And why we have a good track record for winning contracts isn't necessarily about putting something on paper and just emailing it over. And that seems to be as a, on the, when I'm on the listing side and, and I get my fair share of that as well, but when, when we seem to be on the listing side, there's an awful lot of agents who will write something up, shoot in the dark as far as all the terms, and then send it over to the listing agent without even a telephone call, without even an email um, of introduction, without even a text message. All I get is this email from transaction desk with a contract. And the terms aren't even near, for example, what the other 28, 29, 30 offers that we already have on the table are for this. And somehow then they expect that that was due diligence and advocacy for their client. And the fact is it's a sorry, no. Um, and, and that's often a disservice to their buyer clients. So one of the things that we wanna talk about today when, it when we talk about winning contracts is to follow the ARC. And that ARC stands for arming yourself reconnaissance and we cannot dispute that portion of gathering data surveying and information and then to compile a winning offer and compiling a winning offer just for your quick heads up 
doesn't entail just filling out a purchase contract and filling that out and sending it over with your agency agreement and then expecting positive results. Not in this market. Other markets, absolutely, but not in this one. And so let's go ahead and get started and kind of look at some of, of the things that we want to start looking at today, if I can. Uh, the first, let's set our minds right a little bit. Information is power. Only if you can take action with it, then and only then does it represent knowledge and consequently power. Da Daniel Burris is a disruptor author. He's a disruptor business consultant, and he's a, he's a best-selling author on New York Times bestsellers list. If you've never read, read or looked at his stuff, I highly encourage you to do so. The kicker to that, of course, is the act of taking action with information so to represent knowledge and power is the act of strategic communication. And that's where I come in as far as trying to present things to our team, trying to present things to the people that I advise, coach, consult with, et cetera, is behind that strategy because that is what is so arming ourselves. Remember the arc. You know, the, we want to arm ourselves, follow that arc, arm. So we want to start off with discovery and education. Now, when I'm talking about discovery and education, the first, one of the first things I'm talking about is how about with your buyers? Do your buyers fully understand, for example, um, what position they're in? So talk story. When I used to teach at the University of Hawaii on Maui for a while, one of the things that, you know, was very common about, you know, if I want to go for a visit with somebody and I want to, you know, have a cup of coffee, we didn't always talk about, you know, in terms of, hey, let's go for a cup of coffee or, you know, I'd like to come visit with you for a while. The, the term over there, and I always loved that term was let's go talk story. And, and so when I, when I say talk story, let's find out about our buyers really. And so when I'm talking about finding out about the buyers, do they have to move by a certain time and do they have a backup plan if we don't get a property right away? But we, we want to, and that's our, our goal, but it also tells us um, what the desperation moves might have to be if we have to come down to a plan C, because we should always have a plan B through Z, right? Because there are 26 letters in the alphabet and we have to have that many plans. Do we just do? In this market, at when we represent buyers, and if we're truly going to be their advocate, it's not just one plan and then, oops, sorry, it didn't work. We have to constantly be thinking critical problem solving, et cetera. Because if you came into this market right now as a realtor and said, hey, I'm in, I've, be I've become a realtor because I like houses and I like people, you're out of this market in the next five months. That's just the way it's going to be. You're going to be looking for a retail job or something of that nature, um, you know, or going back into the profession you might have been prior because we have to be critical thinkers and problem solvers. So talk story. And when I say talk story, I, I first want to start off with expectation management. Let's talk economics, supply and demand economics. Well, Arizona, in fact, heck, most of the country right now, there aren't enough houses for everybody who wants one. And what that basically means is that prices are inflated. And we have a lot of buyers who haven't bought houses in a very long time or have come from if there still exists, a, the perception of a buyer's market. How many times have we heard people actually say that, well, there's no way I should have to pay full price. Pay full price? You and I both know that pro properties are going 30, 40, 50% above list price. And if we're gonna write only at, at uh, list price or below, the likelihood is our expectations are not realistic. So supply and demand economics are, just plays a very basic and key role here. And then finally, we need to know the playbook. We need to know the playbook because, you know, I don't always ask, and we can't always ask our buyers, hey, how much uh, money do you have in the suitcase that you've got hidden in your mattress behind the house? Okay, I've mixed a lot of metaphors there, but you get the idea. <laughs> They don't, always, they don't always have lots and lots of money just stashed in a suitcase. They don't have it in coffee cans buried in their backyard. People don't operate that, that like that anymore. In fact, most people have a job. And when I say that, what do I mean by that, right? Job just over broke. They're living paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. And they've got a little bit of savings. And they probably worked really, really hard in order to get the down payment and the closing costs that they're getting right now just to get into the house. So what's next? Do we tell them, sorry, Charlie? We really need to start thinking about how do we actually work the playbook? So we have to arm ourselves with that kind of information. That strategy playbook looks like this. First off, price. All right, 
Those that can will and will have an easier time. So those that have the cash and you know can do it, great. Those that can't, then one of the first things we need to recognize and make sure our buyers recognize that if we're not waiving an appraisal or putting in kind of any kind of an appraisal contingency buffer or anything else in there, then the price in the contract on line 10 is smoke and mirrors because it's going to always be based on that appraisal. So why, you know, what's the strategy here? Oftentimes the strategy is to get the prequal as the highest possible number that they can possibly get and then go in at that number. And why am I saying that? Because when if you say that to buyers straight out, they're going to go, oh my goodness, what did you just say? I'm not going to go up there. Because we all know there's a difference between the price that the buyer is comfortable paying and the price that the lender says they can qualify for. So if we're, you know, if, if those prices are close and look, if we're in desperation mode, are you willing to pay everything on that, uh, that that's on that prequal? If the answer is yes, first thing we want to do is get a prequal for as high as we can get it and put that number, just go in at that number. And the reason I say that is it's smoke and mirrors. What's the purpose then? The purpose is to be the last person standing in the conversation of multiple offers. Well, these people are willing to go this. What are we really saying? Eventually we're gonna have a conversation with the listing agent that basically says, look, you know, this is the situation. We're also talking story with the listing agent, aren't we? And so we're all, you know, we, we wanna make sure that the listing agent is fully aware that, hey, we know it's probably not going to appraise for that. You know it's probably not going to appraise for that. But what are we actually saying? We are so generally, genuinely interested in this property. We so much want this house. And, and these people are so deserving. Remember, advocacy does not have to mean controversy. These people are so deserving that we really want to, want to get this house. The argument that we're making, what we're actually trying to say here, is that we will give you whatever it appraises for. If there's no buffer there, the argument is whatever we can get it to appraise for, we'll get get it. You know, we'll give it to you. Now, with that comes a little bit of responsibility from the buyer's agent in terms of helping that deal and that transaction, but I mean, maybe helping put together some sort of, as what we say, a secret appraisal package. You know that that you know we're going to do as many comps and help help them do the comps and stuff to get it up as high as we possibly can toward that purchase price, so there isn't a greater argument at the when the appraisal comes in. But we're, we we want to actually have that, and then you know when I say secret, let's leave all of those comps nice and neat for the appraiser on the kitchen island when they come in to do the appraisal. Uh, but when we get that point, okay. So having said that. Let's talk about earnest money, number two. Now we have to have this talk, of course, um, in terms of how much, okay, and what, and at what risk. Can we make earnest money? I mean, and, and, and when I say how much and what risk, because there are different rules of thumb each agent applies to determine the amount of earnest money. And that earnest money, let's face it, it's often... It's often uh, guided differently and it protects the buyer in many ways because they can get it back for a lot of reasons. So why would the seller accept your offer over somebody else's? When it comes to earnest money, can we, do we have the capacity to at a certain point, the earlier the better, if we're really trying to get something accepted, to make that earnest money hard, or in this case, when we're talking to a buyer, they don't understand the word hard. We want to obviously use the word non-refundable and understand what that means and what is at risk and how soon can we do it? Can we do that immediately? We are so interested in this house that no matter what happens with the inspection, we're willing to do, we're willing to make that money hard immediately, or we're willing to do that at a certain point. If we're willing to put so much money down on the earnest money to show that we have the power to complete the loan, are we willing to make part of the earnest money hard? We don't have to do all of it necessarily. So remember, of course, in this particular play with the earnest money, if we are able to, and, and when we're doing an exploratory uh, talk story, if you will, with our buyers, we go over, at Snowbird Nation anyway, we go over all of these and we go over all of these in, in various ways to try and determine what weapons do we have at our disposal in this negotiation. So how much, what's the risk? Can we make it completely non-refundable and at what point? And 
can we make it partially refundable if they're not comfortable with it all becoming uh, refundable? Believe it or not, people get a little bit more um, uh, interested in making it non-refundable after we've lost so many offers. Yes, yeah, Sarah, I said it. After we may have lost so many offers that all of a sudden the buyers are starting to get a little bit more realistic in what's possible and what they're going to need to do in order to make it happen. So uh, at that point, so the earlier to, the earlier that the seller can see non-refundability and that the money even might be released to the seller early is going to be certainly possible. All right, number two, uh, number three, the appraisal. All right, so the appraisal, of course, is a big thing right now because cash offers, and we're getting a lot of investors right now that are coming in with cash. So how do you compete with cash that doesn't typically have an appraisal contingency? The same issue here applies. Can I actually waive the appraisal? That means I got money in the bank. That means I have, and that means money beyond. And we go through calculations. This is what you're gonna need to close. And if the, if the appraisal comes in this, and you're putting this percent down to you know down payment that plus this closing this is all all we got that we all we are you going to need possibly to close that entire loan package do you have money beyond that that might be an incentive to try and raise that price by that house so the money issue if it's there and i don't want to make it the issue but if it's there you can make it the big issue and go and run with it but that's not always the case when it is always the case, you know, just run with it and go. And, and those shouldn't be the, those, those are the easy ones to close in this market because cash is king. We all know that we all, we all see it. And we all sometimes get smarted as a result of it when our buyer isn't the cash buyer. So as we start looking at that in terms of, of, of appraisal, can I waive it, waive the contingency? Or if not, can I offer an appraisal buffer based on how much money I might have after that? Because if I don't have and I'm going to go ahead and say it. If I don't have an agent who is really skilled at coming up with numbers that are pretty close to what properties have been appraising for, and let's face it, in this market, the appraisals have sort of been kind of throwing numbers at a, throwing darts at a number board anyway. In some cases, that we sort of put our buyers in some sometimes in jeopardy because if that appraisal comes in really low, all of a sudden their cash is completely gone, and now they're cash poor to try and get into a house. So we want to be very careful with completely waiving for a lot of our buyers just for their own protection. So my suggestion is almost always in these, in this case, uh, an appraisal buffer or often referred to as a partial appraisal contingency wa waiver. All right, enough about appraisals. We all know that one exists and that we all know that one's there, but let's talk about inspections. Can you waive inspections? People do all the time. Um, should you waive inspections? Wow. I'm not sure that's a question I want to get into um, right now with trying to get the contract accepted, but there are certainly some ethical issues and waivers that, you know, and make sure that we go over those waivers pretty closely with the buyers to understand that waiving an inspection means this. It might mean you get the house, but it also means that there's a little bit higher liability and risk for you involved. And so let's make sure we're, we're, we're good with that. And if somebody says, wait a minute, I'm not really excited about that kind of risk because when I saw the house, this and this and this looked to be a problem. Fair enough. So if we can't waive the inspection completely, can we waive, and these again, just armor, uh, you know, arm ourselves with what, what positions we have. Can we waive part of the inspection? All right, the inspection is going to be, uh, is going to exclude the actual improvements in structure. That might make a seller very happy to know that they're not going to get hit with a bunch of repair requests on a potential binzer. But at the same time, you've got some interest in calling the HOA or the city to see if you can actually do the business that you want to do out of the home or something like that. And basically, you're looking at it and saying, there are other issues involved that have nothing to do with the condition of the home that I need to check out. So can I exclude the structure? Can I exclude the structure, save for the major mechanicals? I only want to actually inspect the major mechanicals. Think about this in terms from the seller's perspective. What are we going to do to give them the peace of mind that we're not going to try and nickel and dime them? We can, we can basically put, you know, do that here and actually say for the inspection, I'm waiving it by money or waiving it by specific item like the house, uh, or I'm only inspecting the HVAC system because that's the only thing I worry about. 
whatever their thoughts are on that, you know, have that conversation. So you know what you're armed with, because having this information, of course, helps the next few conversations that we're going to have with the listing agents, for example. Okay, then next, the due diligence period. Well, the contract says 10 days. Isn't it supposed to be 10 days? Well, it doesn't have to be. You know, some people actually put a number in there. You know, some people add, num add numbers to there. You know, uh, I've, I've seen a fourplex from an investor that we did, for example, create, you know, change that 10 days to 15 because that's what they're accustomed to when they buy multifamily properties. So we can certainly add, add days to it. But in this market, listing agents and sellers want to see those that number as little as possible because they want to see that go through fast. You know, we want to know whether or not this is a done deal fast. So if you're going to put zero, put zero. If you're just going to accept it as is, because that's the kind of, you know, the decision you've made and the buyers are willing to take that risk, put a zero there. If not, drop it. Now, let me go ahead and say that if you're going to drop it, my first uh, suggestion to you is make sure that you've got an inspector on call that when you write that offer, you call them up in, uh, in advance and say, look, I'm getting ready to drop this to five days. We're getting ready to drop this. Here, here, you know, here's how I would do it. Five business days. That kind of buys you a little time in case you didn't calculate Memorial Day in there. Um, but it also gives you a, an opportunity to call your inspector and say, can you fit us in in the next three days? Because I need at least two days to, to go over the report and negotiate and, and you know, figure out if we need to make any moves. And so make sure that if you drop the inspection period and are going to have an inspection, it actually fits in with your inspector's schedule. Because if your favorite inspector isn't there to do that, then, you know, you, you may have actually, mm, you know, put yourself in a hard position. So be careful on that. Um, so inspections. Uh, I'm sorry, reduce diligence period. If you can reduce the diligence period, it's going to save you, you know, it's going to put you in a better light. Number next, whatever the next one, uh, flexible COE. Before I write an offer, you know, after, in, in all of this, I'm going to have called the listing agent and I'm going to ask that question if they haven't already got it in the MLS. What's their preferred COE? Um, but I am always going to put in, um, call the lender too and find out how fast they think they can close and what their preference for closing is. Again, just like that number and the prequel, their comfort level and what the lender says that they can, they can do. I'm gonna you know, ask the lender the same question. What's your absolute, what can you do if I have to push you? And what's your comfort level in how many days are you gonna take to close? Um, and having said that, um, then I'm gonna also try and match that to, um, to, to whatever the seller's desires are. So flexible COE. And I'm also going to put in the section eight of the contract, uh, a statement that says buyer and seller are willing to um, move up the closing date should all, all buyer and seller agree and all contingencies be met. Um, having said that, I'm basically saying, look, this is the date we're trying to do if it's 45 days out for a VA loan, for example, and uh, this is the date we're trying to do. But if we, if you guys want it sooner and we can get it done sooner and we'll push, if that's your, your, your desire, we're going to go ahead and move this, you know, as we go, put it in the section eight. Don't try and put the honor before stuff because the honor before can get a little confusing and lawyers have been involved. Um, okay. So due diligence period, COE date, um, post, uh, possession variance. You know, in this market, some sellers don't know where they're going, especially where they're going. You know, if they have to live out of a car, have to live out of a truck, have to live out of a hotel after they sell. And the expectation in Arizona is possession at COE, uh, possession variance, right? So you can give po a post-possession agreement if it's under 14 days. I recommend if it's over 14 days, a lease agreement. But at this point, though, if you're going to have that conversation, are the buyers able to ride out whatever a post-possession time period might need to be. Are they, are they truly able to do it? They're staying with their family, for example, and they can do it another week if they have to. Um, they're staying in an apartment and their lease doesn't run out for another month and they gave themselves that buffer time. Um, they're staying in an apartment and they're able to do another month, month, month by month rent and they're able to get another month on it or, or a couple of weeks on it or, or whatever it might be. Find out what their their desperation notices are because if we can give and be lax on possession date, we will often find that that is enough to overcome a price variance in the minds of the sellers. Um, HOA addendum. Hey, we, by the time we get to uh, 
to actually writing an offer and compiling that offer. Um, sometimes the listing agent has put in the, you know, the various forms in the MLS for us to fill out in advance, and sometimes they haven't. So if they haven't, as a buyer's agent, I think it's uh, incumbent upon us in this market to call that HOA as soon as we can, find out on this particular address, find out whether or not there are capital uh, gain, capital improvement costs, find out what the costs are for transfer fees, um, you know, and, and the things that the seller should have done and haven't yet done, or the listing agent mm, isn't supposed to have helped them, but oftentimes they will. Um, and and so, but, so then that being said, can I put in section eight right up front? So it's not even a, 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 a thought process. Who's going to pay uh, for line 75 and 76 HOA transfer fees and, and, uh, um, and, and the capital improvement fees. So who's going to pay those buyer or seller? Cause right now there are check boxes and those check boxes are blank on whether it's a filled out form by the seller or not. And so can I put, can I preempt that and put it right in there? So that's, it's not even a question to the seller. If I already did my due diligence and I already know what the numbers are, I can have that conversation with the buyer. I can actually put in section eight of the purchase contract that in the HOA addendum, lines 75 and 76 ought to be checked by. It helps us if I can put buyer. I won't include it if, it's, if the buyers are saying, no, that's going to be the seller. That should be split 50-50. If it makes it look good to the seller, I'm going to put it in section eight right now. Okay, um, some, of, some of you are familiar with an escalation clause. I wanna go over it real quick, um, just in case you're not. An escalation clause is not about uh, who, can, who can run the, the number up to the highest. The, the escalation clause should be about making a buyer feel confident that you're not a used car salesman. And we're not. And you know, but, but sometimes when we look at somebody and say, you gotta go $30,000 more than list price, they're gonna look at you and go, who are you? And now they're equating you if they haven't been fully educated on the market. Now they're equating you with a stereotypical used car salesman tactic, trying to run the numbers up and accuse you of, of, of trying to run up your commission. So an escalation clause will kind of defeat that and take the wind out of that argument in this respect. And I often, you know, will, will say, look, here's my cell phone put my cell phone on the table. Let's say you're in the market for a cell phone and I'm, I basically have a number on that cell phone, the, the, not, not the telephone number, but let's say the number is $5. Would you pay $5 for that cell phone? Oh, sure I would. Okay, just checking. Um, would you pay $6? Because if, if, if this person over here wants to pay me six, would you pay $6? Yeah, okay. Would you pay me seven? Well, if somebody else was paying six, I might pay seven. Okay. Um, let's keep running this up. At what number, what's the exact number you would tell me I'm not paying one penny more than this number. 2750? Really? Okay. All right. So let's take that. So what we want to do with an escalation clause, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, is we want to go in at the at the number you feel most comfortable at. Yeah. I gotta tell you, I, I don't think they're gonna take five thousand dollars less than your than their list price as a serious number right now. But I get it. I, I understand where you're coming from. So let's go ahead and put that $5,000 less. But may I maybe talk about an escalation clause so that we're not wasting our time and we, I can actually teach you something about what's happening in this market right now. And so let's go ahead and write that escalation clause. And that escalation clause is going to read, in the event of multiple offers, buyer is willing to pay. And my suggestion, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, is that if the house is worth $500,000 or less, $1,001 over, uh, over the highest bona fide offer, uh, not to exceed a maximum of, you know, whatever your, your top dollar is. Um, and then copy of bona fide, a full copy of bona fide offer to a company counter offer. So what we're essentially doing, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer is, is saying, look, in the event of multiple offers, because maybe you don't fully believe me because you don't trust the industry. I get that. Lots of people don't. And so let's go ahead and, do, and, and put an escalation clause in. And let me show you the other offer that comes back if and when we are successful in this particular endeavor. If not, and we don't win the endeavor, I'm going to show, I'm, we're going to keep track of this. And as soon as that posts for closing, we're going to look at it and see where that thing actually sold. And, and, you know, sometimes it's part of an education process. And so we want to actually follow through on that. So an escalation clause, can I do it? Will I do it? Well, remember, of course, if I'm not waiving the appraisal, even the escalation number is smoke and mirrors. 
But if I am waiving the appraisal or, you know, in any way, shape or form, then that escalation clause is not smoke and mirrors. And now we need to not only put in the prequal, but we need to also submit when we eventually submit uh, that offer a proof of funds to show that we're, we're you know, Mr. and Mrs. Listing agent. Um, we expect that the property is probably going to um, uh, appraise for about 330. Um, I know that this offer is for 340. Here's where we're showing you that we have funds to not only close the deal, but an extra 10,000. So, okay. So having said that, um, then the next question is, whoopsie, what happened there? Okay. Um, if you're talking to me, Sarah, that you're on my, you're on, you're mute. Um, I did mute myself. Yes. Um, <laughs> quick question about escalation clauses, Mike. Yeah, sure. Um, for escalation clauses, do you put the highest net offer to include sellers paid H, uh, home warranty, HOA, et cetera, or just off SP appraisal waiver, et cetera. Sales price, I guess. You can, you can do it either way, but uh, remember of course that um, uh, depending upon the qualifications of the listing agent, and I'm not suggesting anything about the industry or the people, but that, you know, we know that depending upon who we're talking to, they are trained in variable ways. And so we have variable skill sets out there. And so myself, I will not, I will just put the number in and let them interpret it. I don't say net. I don't say gross. I don't say, you know, go in there because once I look at the offer, if I need to use that ambiguity, strategic communication, if I need to use that ambiguity as, as part of my argumentation later on down the road, I can. But what I'm actually saying right now is I want to be the last person standing. And when you send me a counter offer, if it's a single and not a multiple counter offer, you're basically saying I'm the last person standing in the multiple offers. So now that counter offer, listen to what we just said. The, 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 um, the other offer, complete copy of the bona fide offer needs to accompany the counter offer. A counter offer is not, I didn't say we were gonna sign the counter offer but that might open us up for negotiation. And now we're the last people standing for that negotiation. And nice. that's where you, that's where you want to be. So I'm not going to actually go as far as to define it and delimit it that closely um, in that respect, because they're going to send me back a complete copy and then I can define it as we need to at that point. Awesome, Mike. Well, just a quick um, heads up guys. If you need to get off, if you, you know, these are usually 30 minutes, but if you need to get off, we are recording this. However, we've got a lot more information for those of you that want to stick around. So if you want to, if you need to get off, like I said, and you want a copy of the recording, just reach out to your business development manager um, because you're going to want all this information. Back to you, Mike. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So then after an escalation clause, seller incentives. What else can we do for that seller? Here's where we can be creative. Here's where we're trying to catch their attention. All right, so on the day of on the day the sellers are going to move out three days before closing, uh, buyers will have uh, one hundred dollars worth of their favorite pizza delivered to their home during their their moving day. I don't know. Well, I, you know what we're basically saying is come up with some ideas that could be creative and that could catch the attention of the seller. Going, dang, that's creative. I like those people. Because what you want to do is, is, is just that. So does that mean I'm going to give you a gift certificate to U-Haul so you can go buy boxes? Does that mean I'm going to, you know, as I said, send you pizza or pay part of your moving, you know, your moving company bills? Who knows? Am I going to pay part of your closing costs? Be creative here because that's the kind of thing that catches and keeps the attention of the sellers. Now, what about the listing agents? Listing agent incentive. No, I can't pay the listing agent. I'm not going to do that because that would be that would cause all kinds of problems and trouble. But and and you know we're doing this for landmark title, so you know with all due deference and respect to landmark title, I'm just going to go ahead and say this in this market. Remember, of course, that it is your landmark title business development uh, uh, person's responsibility to create what I'm going to call, and I do this to everybody, vanity relationships with your agents, with, with all the agents out there. 
So you as the listing agent may very well have a good re reputation, a good uh, a rapport with a particular couple of people, a few people at any given title company. And of course, we're doing this for landmark title. So we're going to suggest that you have that, that relationship here. Now, having said that, ignore it. In this market, eventually when I call the, if it's not in the MLS, if the MLS specifically says, you know, um, for a smoother transaction, escrow has already been opened with, you know, uh, no name title company works on the internet and a shady op operation at that, uh, you know, at this particular email, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to go look them up. And if it's not a fly by night internet or, uh, institution of some sort, um, I'm going to tell you it could behoove you and be the difference between the prop, an offer accepted and rejected if you actually get that particular uh, offer put in, you know, and, and put, put in the title company on that offer, put theirs. As much as we would like to put ours and our vanity relationships that we have, we want to put ours. Um, and sometimes in section eight, I've even had some people go as far as to say RESPA section 3.2 suggests that the buyer is allowed to choose their own. And if the, if the seller rejects it, um, you know, wants to choose their particular title company, they're going to pay the, um, they're going to pay the, uh, um, fees for the buyer buyer's title work. Great. You can either win the battle or get the contract. In this market, um, if, if I were to do something, and I have done stuff like that before as a buyer's agent, but in this market, if you want the contract, you're going to immediately call them and say, hey, which title company are you using? Because we want this contract. Does it matter to you, listing agent? And if the listing agent says, yeah, I have a relationship with you know XYZ title company, then it is my suggestion you do it because I have seen more contracts get rejected because the agent's weren't then able to feed the their title company. So let's just like put that, that out there right now. Though, Mike, I like the suggestion of calling them up and asking. I mean, if you get this contract accepted, you're going to be talking with them a lot. So why not establish that rapport? Let them know what you're thinking because sometimes you'll be in the, the inverse. No, we don't really have a title company. I've got a great one. I'll make sure this deal goes smooth. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can kind of work that, but starts with a, uh, a phone call. And just for you, make sure that you are RESPA compliant. You can't control what other people do um, and how they write their contracts, but you can keep to your own standards. So even in those types of deals, just make sure that you are within the standards. Excellent. R, follow the arc. R is reconnaissance. Now, reconnaissance uh, is often defined as a mission to obtain information by visual observation or other detection methods about the activities and resources. Now, what I didn't put there, of course, is it's usually a military term. It's usually, it's usually talking about an enemy or, or the strategy on the other side. It doesn't have to be here, but what we're really talking about is you have got to do your due diligence and you've got to find out what's going on because if you don't make the phone call and start building something with the other agent right away, you are not getting the deal done and that's straight up. So advocacy is friendly. Now, I will tell you, I, I, I'm actually chuckling at the number of people that wind up calling me as a buyer's agent when I'm on the listing side trying to be a bully. And, and that, just, that just kind of befuddles me. Um, advocacy is friendly. So reach out to those listing agents. Be humble. Be nice. Ask all kinds of questions. And, you know, be overly helpful. Talk story. Talk story. In other words make the case for you, you know, why do, why do your people deserve to have that house? Why do your age, your clients deserve to have that house? What's their story? You know, I'm, I'm dealing with, um, I'm dealing with a couple of, uh, a couple of people. One's a nurse. The other one's a police officer. They have had a really rough year. They've been on the front line of this whole pandemic thing for so long. And they, they've been living out of the garage of their mother's house for the last year and a half because they just haven't been able to get a house and now they have their finances in order and what am i doing i'm trying to elicit the empathy of the listing agent so that they're thinking that's a nice agent 
that's a nice buyer's agent. And I really like their, the, the story that they're working with. And I appreciate that. So be humble, be nice. Take the cooperative, not the competitive approach. Because if you take the competitive approach, you're not going to the top of the list. Ask questions. Miss um, listing agent, can you tell me, um, is there anything else that your sellers might be looking for to make this a smoother transaction for them? You know, what, where are they going? Oh, the, okay. When is that new construction going to be completed? I see. Okay. So would it help if we move the close of close of escrow closer to that time, or would it be better for them for the, to be able to use the cash if we actually move the close of escrow to, you know, 30 days before that, and then gave them a month? You know, when you start doing that, make sure you are in constant communication also with the lender to make sure that time frame works with the expiration date and the lock-in date of their loan. Uh, most, most lenders are going to require that if it's a home occupied primary that they occupy the property within 60 days of close of escrow. So keep that in mind, um, but be overly helpful. Talk story. You'll get a lot of listing agents who will tell you right up front, I can't tell you that price. You know what, I, cause I'll ask, what's your highest offer? What, what, you know, what are we competing against? Is money the only thing that your sellers are looking for? And sometimes it is, I get it. Or are they looking for somebody who might take uh, as good of care of that house as they did, who might love that house like they did? Um, there are other ways, uh, other things that are important to the seller. Find out what's important to them. Um, the listing agent who says, I can't tell you anything about the offer. I got to tell you, uh, you know, first off, I hope they've had that conversation with the seller. Um, because really what they're doing is they are probably older agents or people who have been taught by older agents. And when I say older, I mean, been in the market a while because in a buyer's market, it makes sense not to disclose offers about what you have, because probably those offers aren't even at list price. And why would I want to reveal that? I want the next offer to come in higher. So it's in my best interest, my seller's best interest, not to tell you. In a seller's market, I want to know as a buyer's agent if I'm wasting my time. And so I'm going to ask the, the, the seller's agent right up front, what's your highest offer? And they're going to say to me, because they came from a buyer's market, and that's where I'm getting at with this. I can't tell you that. I, I understand that, um, Mr. or Miss Listing Agent. Um, are you using the new um, ERs from the, America, the uh, Arizona Association of Realtors? Well, yeah, I just signed this up uh, last week. Okay. Did you know that the uh, ER um, on um, uh, line 154 actually has a checkbox there that gives that that gives uh, your seller permission to, to give you permission to discuss those offers that come in that you already have? Folks, that wasn't on the previous ER. This is, this is groundbreaking for this market. Um, so line 154, a seller gives permission or doesn't give permission to disclose and discuss other offers. Um, did you actually have a talk with your, uh, did, you, did you have a talk uh, with your seller about that? Because I, I, I'd, I'd really appreciate it if you did, um, only because, you know, it, it would help them. In this market, I need to know if I'm wasting my time. And, and, and I, I think you, you know, I, I don't want to waste yours either. So can you help me out on this? Now, I've had a lot of agents you know, we'll, we'll take that and, and go, oh, it's interesting because they weren't paying attention to the ER. This is a relatively new change to the ER. They weren't paying attention to the exclusive right to sell listing contract. And so line 154 is important. And sometimes a nice friendly reminder can be helpful um, again, but this is one of those things where you might, if the wrong tone will strike the wrong deal and you're not gonna get anywhere with it. So reach out to the listing agents. Start building a rapport immediately with the listing agents. But remember, and here's the big one, not all real estate agents live in 2021. So texting them, I mean, I've actually worked with agents in the Arizona market, in the Phoenix Valley, um, okay, Sun Lakes, um, that the agents themselves, first off, asked us to fax them something, and secondly, didn't have a cell phone. I was calling a landline at their home. Okay, so reach out in all ways. 
We don't know what the most comfortable and convenient form of communication is for every individual, even on this call. And so reach out always. So I'm going to call them. And if, you know, all the questions I just said I, I had, if I got them on the phone, let's face it, some of you are going, listing agents don't answer their phones. Okay, great. Send all those same questions and your story about your clients and stuff in an email. Include the highlights in a text message, but do it all three ways. Phone, voicemail, if they're not answering, uh, text message and email. What if they answer their phone? Do it the other two ways as well anyway, because I want them to remember who I am. I want them to remember who I am and I want them to work with me. So I want to be the person that's come at your mind, their mind going, damn, that person follows up. Damn, that person is, you know, is, is persistent. Damn, that person is, it keeps calling me, but, but he's not nagging me. He's just trying to check in. So reconnaissance, because I'll tell you what, taking a hard stance, even if the first contract falls through, you want to be the first person that agent thinks about before they put it back on the market. And we've been in that position quite a few times as well. So compile that winning offer. There's a stopwatch there. Time is of the essence. You've got to do this as fast as you can. As soon as you know that some, your clients want this, you've got to get on this right away. There is no stopping. If you want the, they want the deal, you've got to work. Sometimes that means middle of the night. So be as complete as you can. All the docs in the MLS, get them done. SPUDs, HOA, MCA, the clue, Whatever they've put in the MLS, make sure they're signed by the buyer when you send them everything. Any other addenda there? Include it. Get it done now. Agency, of course, right? Purchase agreement. Got it. Post possession. If I've already talked to the buyer, uh, to the um, the sellers that uh, the seller's agent, and they need post possession, and I've already talked to the buyer saying they can give post possession. Include it with the offer. Don't give me a line in Section Eight that's lazy. Don't give me a line in section eight that just says, oh, well, fill it out when, you know, if we get accepted. Uh, what you're saying is you're not committing to getting it accepted. And yes, I'm, you know, I'm going to be a little bit harsh here because I've seen those things come through as a listing agent. And then when they come through, what, what I'm finding is they are, uh, they are now all of a sudden I'm getting a post-possession agreement that's unreasonable. Nope. If you can, post-possession agreement as few dollars as possible to be held at escrow at closing for a damage deposit, zero dollars a day. This is how we're doing them right now. Zero dollars a day, and then maybe like 250, $300 a day, zero dollars a day during the post-possession agreement. But if they overstay their welcome, we, we, we will go ahead and, and show Mr. and Mrs. Seller, um, you know, you overstay your welcome, we, we are gonna hit you with a pretty hefty penalty, 300 bucks a day, 500 bucks a day, whatever it might be. Cause you know, my, my buyers are gonna be generous, um, but only on what we've agreed on. We're not going to uh, specifically, um, you know, let you ride that out too much. So post-possession agreement. Has there been anything else that's pertinent a well addendum, septic and well addendum, solar addendum, uh, an, age, an, an age restricted community addendum. Is there anything else we can jump on that we can get that done ahead of time and, and include it with the offer? Be as complete as possible so that the, the, the idea is, wow, everything is here, the listing agent says. Boy, wouldn't it be easier if I just had them sign, my seller sign this and just be done with the whole package and and I'm already in escrow and I don't have to fight with the uh, with the uh, buyer's agent because the buyer's agent has done their due diligence and completed everything. It's all here. The final key, follow up again by all methods. Stay in constant contact. Hey, just checking in. Did you get a chance to actually uh, uh, present yet? Oh, you're not presenting until seven o'clock in the evening tomorrow. Got it. Thank you. Six o'clock in the evening, the next day, I want to be on the phone with them, voicemail, text, email. Why? Because I want to be on top of their mind. I want to, hey, just checking. I want, good luck presenting. If you have any questions, you know, my buyers are willing to do whatever it takes to make this as smooth as possible for your sellers. Just let me know what it's going to take to do that. And we're happy to comply, you know, within our capacity and reason to do so. Okay. Remember, you can fill your ego or you can fill your pocketbook. The choice is yours. You know, you can win the battle and lose the war, just like that whole title thing, right? You know, the buyer's choice, great. Buyer's choice can choose something else because I've got 28 other offers here and the top four have selected our preferred title company, says the listing agent. 
And as a result, there it is, you know? And so, so you can be right. I, I mean, I've often had people send me stuff back saying, you didn't sign this. And I'm looking at it going, we've never signed that. It's, it's never been a requirement. Title's never asked us for that, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to look at that and I'm going to go, is there any harm in my buyers signing this as opposed to not signing it? And if the answer is no, hey, get them to sign it, whatever they need, whatever you need, because we want to be cooperative. We want to be compliant, stay in compliance and stay true to the seven fiduciary duties of you know, our real estate license to our clients. But that also means getting the deal done. And that's what we are about. So that's kind of my quick, uh, see, two hours and 20 minutes down to an hour, what is it, 40 minutes, uh, an hour, whatever, whatever it might be. But that's my quick overview on all the things that kind of go into us trying to pull together winning offers in this market. Do we have a high hit rate? Yeah, we do. It's because we follow all this formula and this recipe almost to the letter every time. And it works. It works. Uh, that's that's one of the, I mean, like I said, this is a topic that's on everybody's minds. You know, when you're going up against a lot of other real estate agents and a lot of other offers, systems, systems are your best bet. And I know it's Snowbird Nation. That's what you guys are really, really big on. And, and Mike has perfected these. That's why we had him come on today, talk about it, uh, because flat out. His systems work. So thank you, Mike. That was amazing information today. Um, good job keeping it under two and a half hours. You're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and then we're just going to go over, if anybody has any questions um, while we're finishing up, please, please, please let us know. Um, I'm going to go over a few other classes that we have coming up. Um, so pop them up in the questions if you have any. <clears throat> so guess what, guys? Next week is June. Yeah, I know. We're already there. So we've got some great classes coming up in June. <clears throat> One is um, Down Payment Assistance Program. It's back in action. This is going to be Wednesday, June 2nd at 10 a.m. It's the same time as Marketing Matters. So if you want to attend this class live, um, just let us know. We'll get you a copy of the Marketing Matters um, recording for next week as well. And then next Thursday, we have Market Insights. This is Landmark Title's monthly market stats, market insights. It's market insights for a reason, because we don't just give you the stats. We pull them apart. We pull apart what is actually going on in our market so that you are well-equipped to go out there with this information to your clients. Information is power. And in real estate, it is no difference. So this is gonna be next Thursday at 9.30 a.m. And then we've got another 1031 exchange seminar coming up. I had the pleasure this past week of, of being on Sheila's 1031 exchange seminar. And it was great. Honestly, it was great information. And we're seeing a lot of this. As people are getting out of places like California, they're wanting to do these 1031 exchanges because they're not wanting to pay high California taxes. They're wanting to kind of bring it over to Arizona, invest their money here. But I even learned, like I said, on the Zoom, is you've got to do this off the bat. You've got to do the 1031 exchange before you do anything else. So if you don't know how to do a 1031 exchange, get on one of Sheila's classes. Uh, the next one is gonna be Wednesday, June 9th, and this is from two to three. So if you wanna register for that, uh, let us know. There's gonna be a couple other ones that we're scheduling with her because like I said, this is a big thing for us right now in Arizona. So make sure that you can do it. Then on June 10th, this is gonna be on a Thursday, is our next mastermind group. They were on Tuesdays, but Tuesdays didn't work for everybody. And I said, you know what, guys, this is our mastermind group. If Tuesdays don't work well and another day of the week works well, let's change it. So the next one is going to be Thursday, June 10th at 10 a.m. This is one is in person. 
at the um, Atrium and Arrowhead on the fourth floor. So if you'd like to attend this, if you haven't attended any of our other masterminds but would like to start attending, we've got about uh, four more masterminds. We do it once a month, um, but there's little follow-up, there's tricks, there's tools to creating brand ambassadors who are gonna be, basically who are gonna generate referrals for you. I mean, we all want people out there on our side generating referrals. So if you want to attend this and you haven't attended yet, don't worry about it. Reach out to myself, Patty, or Michael. Um, we'll get you registered. We'll get you the class and we'll get you caught up. And then Patty has her monthly HUD class. This one is going to be on Thursday, June 24th at 11 a.m. So once again, I say it every week because we have a HUD class every month. HUD is its own beast. If you want to learn more about it, get on this. And that's about it for us today, guys. So once again, thank you so much to the professor, Mike Searcy, for coming on. And, and we call him the professor, not just because of his academic accolades. Yes, that doctor is real in front of his name, but because he really is, he's, he's the man, he's the glue at Snowbird Nation because he's the one that is doing trainings and teaching and the man behind the curtain um, and, and basically out there winning, making sure that his team is moving forward in this market. So Mike, thanks for coming on. That was such great information today. I hope that everybody that attended um, feels more empowered and more equipped to get out there and make sure their contract are accepted. There's a lot, there's a lot to it. I mean, it's funny sometimes in real estate, people don't really understand or don't think real estate agents do anything. Um, yeah, no, there's so much to it. <laughs> so thanks for coming on, Mike. One, one last thing, when we talk about dealing with listing agents, like rapport, trust and loyalty. Those are the four things we often talk about our team about working with clients. Same thing applies. Like, they have to like you and you're going to have much better uh, stance. Build rapport. It's going to mean everything to getting that second offer. If the first one doesn't go through and that offer falls apart, they're calling you next. And then trust. If they trust you, that's the more more reason to get you know, the call. You're not going to necessarily get loyalty from your you know a listing agent to a buyer's agent in this respect. But if you can get to those first three, you've really made some serious strides. Yeah. Hey, you never know about that loyalty, Mike. I know that there's been people on the other side, agents on the other side of the deal from you that have been so impressed after your your deal is done, they actually come join your team. Well, that is true. So. You might get loyalty. You might get more loyalty than you bargained for. <laughs> so thank you, Mike. Thank you to the Snowbird Nation um, group. And once again, thank you to our business development management team. Um, Y'all are awesome. Keep inviting people. Keep sharing all the information that we compile here on Marketing Matters. So thank you to Beth, Becky, Melinda, Mary, Eric in our Las Vegas office, Zach, Patty, Michael, and Jessica. Um, Y'all are awesome. I love seeing you guys on here every week. And of course, thank you to Landmark Title for allowing us to do Marketing Matters every Wednesday and, and just compile all of this amazing information in one place. That's the thing I love the most about Marketing Matters is that we're going over, every week we're going over these marketing tactics, these trainings, and it's all here in bite-sized little chunks. So whatever you want to learn, guess what? There's probably a marketing matters for it. So thank you, Landmark Title. Um, as always, there are six offices across the Valley to service all of your real estate escrow and title needs. Um, you know, Mike was mentioning it's hard right now to get your buyer contracts accepted at the title company that you want. However, we still encourage you to pick up the phone and ask. You never know in this market. That's the one thing that you can predict is that you cannot predict how these deals will go. 
So please, whether you're on the listing side or the buying side, we'd love to work with you. We will get the job done and we will build that loyalty and that relationship. So thank you, everybody. I will see you next week.